Good evening, everybody. Brian Newbert here from GoldenBlack.com, live for the last time, not ever, but this weekend in Gainbridge Fieldhouse. Um, once again, backlit to all hell by the glowing court behind me. Um, this is your GoldenBlack.com rap video following Purdue's 106-67 NCAA tournament round of 32 win over Utah State. Uh, this is brought to you by our friends at the Purdue Club Hotel. Uh, thank you to them, as always, for their support. Hopefully there is a location of theirs now in Detroit. I'll have to look for that tonight because that is where Purdue's headed next weekend for the Sweet 16. Um, this was a really emphatic win for Purdue uh, over Utah State. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of chess beating. I don't think there's going to be riots in the streets. I don't think Purdue is going to, um, you know, party all night tonight or anything like that. I don't think this was necessarily anything that wasn't the expectation. I think uh, Purdue made par essentially here by routing both Grambling and Utah State here to get to the Sweet 16. We know Purdue's an elite team. We know they're one of the best teams in college basketball. Uh, they certainly looked the part in their first two NCAA tournament games, uh, but this is not where they want to be. This was obviously not anywhere near um, anything that's going to be satisfying to them. Um, but they did make a statement of sorts here this weekend. They turned basically the first two uh, rounds of the NCAA tournament into pool play uh, during an AAU event where it's just overmatched opponents. Um, but that had a lot to do with Purdue, obviously. Uh, I think it's going to get lost in this that Utah State is good. I mean, that, that was an eight seed. The eight nine game always yields a pretty difficult game for one seeds, it seems like. Uh, that was a team that won a league that put six teams in the NCAA tournament. This is a team that beat a bunch of ranked opponents uh, throughout the course of the season. The Mountain West was good this year. Utah State was the Mountain West champion. And uh, as I, I put before in something I wrote, this was the day that the Mountain West met the Mountain um, because Zach Eady was obviously uh, the singular force in this game. Uh, predictably, 23 points, 14 rebounds. Only eight drawn fouls. Uh, I don't know what was going on there today. Uh, his productivity really dropped off there. Um, but this was really um, more of an exhibition of Purdue's completeness, sort of flexing its muscles, uh, showing itself to be much more than what people might perceive Purdue, Purdue to be, which is Zach Eady and a veritable cast of thousands. Keep in mind, Braden Smith was a borderline All-American this season. He was a first-team All-Big Ten player. He's one of the best point guards in college basketball. And Purdue took off in this game after he went out with his second foul. A horrible call, um, but Purdue lost its, its uh, real catalyst there late in the first half, and that's when they blew the game open. Um, there's no causation there. It's not like they were worse with Braden Smith on the floor. It's just that this team has a lot going for it here. And... Um, I think when you look at the totality of this, I think Fletcher Lawyer uh, was better than anyone ever gives him credit for. I think he was a real steadying force for Purdue uh, in this game. When Braden Smith went out, I thought he really steadied them. Uh, Lawyer gets 15 points with six assists and no turnovers. Really was an important player during that stretch that blew this game open. Just a really, really good player, borderline great player, and I, I think people don't give him the credit he deserves because he doesn't necessarily get the numbers all the time because he's not the first that mouth that has to be fed on this team. Um, but Purdue's running stuff for him when it needs baskets. Uh, he's making his threes. He's making his pull-ups. He's really putting pressure on defenses. He's making great decisions on and on and on. And he's the first guy I'm talking about, but there's a lot of guys to talk about here. Trey Kaufman ran way back when, in the summer, in the spring, whenever it was, when Purdue made this commitment to playing Trey Kaufman Wren next to Zach Eady, it was 100% driven by Purdue's desire precisely for this, not Gainbridge Fieldhouse, the NCAA tournament. They needed more scoring off the, on the floor. I think the one thing from the FDU game that really scarred Purdue was its inability to score more than 60 points. So I think their stance in the offseason was like Trey Kaufman Wren is a scorer, we can play through him. We can get him touches. We can get him high percentage shooting opportunities. He can be a weapon, and he can be a weapon even playing next to Zach Eady, even though in a lot of ways that doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, Purdue has kind of made it make sense through the course of the season, and 
you have seen through two games here, uh, it really paid dividends. Trey Kaufman ran had 11 points against Grambling. Uh, he had, I can't even remember, uh, 18 points here against, um, who was this? Utah State. So two contrasting situations. Trey Kaufman ran was Purdue's closer against Grambling. They took out Zach Eady when the game was still kind of maybe in the most bizarre of universes, still in play. Uh, there was no way in the world Purdue was going to be threatened in that game. But nevertheless, the scoreboard, the arithmetic involved in the scoreboard told you that crazy things could have happened and you could have been in a situation where you needed your best guys back out there. They took ED out. Trey Kaufman just completely took that game over offensively, kind of steered Purdue home. Today it was the opposite. It was Trey Kaufman really getting Purdue off to a great start. Uh, I think he scored their first eight points. Uh, two of them on end ones off of really physical offensive rebounds that had nothing to do with Zach Eady. Zach Eady is college basketball's preeminent offensive rebounding presence, and that wasn't Zach Eady doing it. That was Trey Kaufman Wren doing it. And I think that's the dynamic with Purdue, where some of these teams just go out there. You prepare for Zach Eady. You prepare for the physicality of him and Trey Kaufman Wren together and throwing in Mason Gillis's drive in there. And then you prepare for it on film, and then you come out here and you see it, and ooh, you know that kind of thing. Uh, it takes you a couple minutes to acclimate to it. I compare it to kind of speed in football, where the game is moving much faster than you even anticipate. Well, when you play Purdue, I think the game hits you much harder than you're anticipating. And I think that kind of happened a little bit to Utah State here. They got off to a good start, um, to Purdue's credit, right? We talk all the time, I've talked all season long about Purdue's one vulnerability, one clear vulnerability, when it turns the ball over and opponents score off of it. Purdue had a few early turnovers. Utah State had seven points off turnovers in the first maybe 10 minutes of the game, whatever it might have been. They finished with 11. So Purdue cleaning up its turnovers is all you need to know, all you need to be reminded about how important it is for Purdue to take care of the basketball, that that is its one vulnerability, its one glaring vulnerability that has shown itself this season. Uh, so credit Purdue for kind of course correcting there, taking care of the basketball, and uh, just really, really putting on an offensive show with guys who aren't necessarily Zach Eady uh, or necessarily in his airspace. Uh, I don't even know what that means, but I'm just kind of talking my way into the, my next point here, giving myself time to remember what my next point was. So just talk until it comes back to you. That's been my longstanding MO in these videos. Um, Miles Colvin and Camden Heidi, uh, much like Trey Kaufman ran and uh, Mason Gillis, I would look at those two guys as kind of a tandem, kind of put their productivity together. But more than anything, it's about what they bring to the floor. Another huge difference that Purdue wanted onboarded on this team just in time for this, again, not Gainbridge Fieldhouse, the NCAA tournament was those two athletic guys who can give you a little bit of, of punch from an athletic perspective, in Miles Colvin's case more than Heidi's, an offensive perspective, uh, defensive versatility that Camden Heidi provides. Miles Colvin has come a long, long way defensively. Trey Kaufman ran also, and I'm, this is not related to my point, but I'm just mentioning this. Trey Kaufman ran has made really significant strides as a defensive player through the course of this year. Players have gotten better through the course of the year. So to everybody who all season long has been saying, Purdue needs to get these guys minutes in games that matter so they're ready for March, well, that's what they were doing in practice. Uh, and I think you're, you saw a lot of the, of the dividends of that improvement uh, here this weekend in Indianapolis. And uh, just the combination of Camden and Heidi and Miles Colvin, their athleticism, and just their ability to play off other guys, Camden Heidi's ability to just make things happen, Miles Colvin's ability to make shots, but also now hold his own defensively. That was the glaring issue when he got to Purdue. The defensive end of the floor, assignments, rebounding. Uh, he did not rebound when he first got here. Today, he comes right in this game. Ian Martinez had been on a heater. Uh, Miles Colvin makes a play to stymie him, coming off a curl to get into a jumper. Uh, I can't remember what happened after that. Later or before, I don't know, it's all out of sequence for me. Miles Colvin gets a, a, a defensive rebound, ends up going to the other end and making a three-pointer off of, I think Zach Eady might have thrown it out to him, I don't remember. Uh, but Colvin made an impact at both ends of the floor. Camden Heidi made an impact at both ends of the floor. 
they're rebounding, they're defending, and they're also chipping in offense. Between the two of them today, they had 19 points between them. Now, obviously, this game was basically over at halftime. Uh, even though Purdue is only up like 16 at halftime uh, before they went on to win by nearly 40, you could see in Utah State in the second half that they looked like they'd been hit by a truck, that what happened to them in the last 10 minutes of that first half, the last six minutes, whatever it was, just completely buried them. And uh, remember, Purdue did that without Braden Smith. Uh, I, I will remind you once again, that was really, really something, that Purdue made that run without its second most important, if not its co-most important offensive player um, in Braden Smith. I think you got to give Lance Jones a lot of credit today. He really stepped up defensively. I think that has been something that's been up and down this season. I know he has a reputation as a very good defensive player. He hasn't always been. Uh, he himself will tell you he wasn't very good against Grambling. Uh, he was really good tonight, and Purdue defensively was really good in this game. I thought they had a great, great game plan for great Osobor, um, who's a really good player. Uh, I, I think Purdue did a pretty good job on him. Um, he was minus 39. That, that's not good. Um, but obviously this game was all Purdue. I don't want to sound like I'm making fun of Utah State, but that kid's a good player. This is a good team. They, they've got good players. Uh, but Purdue is just is obviously one of the best teams out there um, and played like it tonight. They were just – this was a machine-like performance by Purdue. Um, just an absolute uh, obliteration. Purdue made its free throws. I think that that's, that's something notable. Uh, Zach Keady was 7 of 8. He's been up and down lately. Um, biggest point here, once again, this was par for Purdue. You know, uh, this would have been catastrophic had Purdue not gotten out of Indianapolis here given given the draw, given the expectations, given the capabilities of this team. So uh, viewing this as any sort of conquest is probably a little bit premature. I'm sure my level-headed viewers and readers are not viewing this by any means as something that's the end of the line, a victory of sorts. Um, but I think the conquest, for lack of a better term, I don't know where that word came from. I've never used it. I'm not sure I've ever said it out loud, to be honest with you. I just kind of popped in my head. Um, the conquest, the victory, the impressiveness, the flexing of muscles, if you will, really just came in the overwhelming way Purdue won these games. Not that they won these games, just the overwhelming manner in which they won these two games. Purdue really did make a statement here this weekend that they are really, really good. And when they are playing their best, and you don't get any better than what you just saw right there. I'm not talking about Gamebridge Fieldhouse. I'm talking about Purdue's win over Utah State, the performance in those 40 minutes that were played on that court uh, not all that long ago. I think Purdue made a real statement here and just really, really put a face on just how mad this team is, how motivated this team is, and how much this team is capable of. So uh, it's not going to be easy from here on out. Uh, you know, obviously you're not getting any easy wins from here on out. Purdue knows that better than anyone. Gonzaga is going to be better than what you saw the first time around uh, with them. Um, familiarity with Purdue probably does not work in Purdue's favor. Um, but Purdue's better than Gonzaga. Purdue has proven it against Gonzaga. Um, and I would expect their best against Gonzaga. And let's see how many times I can say the word Gonzaga. I don't know if it's Gonzaga or Gonzaga. I, I kind of go back and forth uh, hearing it both ways. Also tournament and tournament, uh, I guess depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, but I'm from New Jersey. I say tournament. Everybody else from out east seems to say tournament. So I'm going to need a ruling on this. I'm going to have to get with the NCAA. I'm going to have to get with... Um, whoever it might be, get a ruling on how to properly pronounce the word tournament and Gonzaga. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions, feel free to share. Um, but no, uh, I, I think the NCAA tournament, tournament is the most randomized championship event in all of sports, uh, almost to the point of it being an illegitimate championship uh, determinant, if that's a word. Um, but it is what everybody watches, so it, it, it's become, you know, obviously the big deal it is. Purdue is poised to make a really good run here, but you never know what's going to happen. Uh, you got to have some luck. The only thing 
that's pertinent to Purdue's situation right now from Virginia's conquest a few years ago. Um, it's just that the Virginia thing reminded you how lucky you have to be to win this thing sometimes because that whole event for Virginia, from Texas Tech to Auburn to obviously Purdue, was luck. It was the l longest l l lucky streak I've probably ever seen in sports. Um, Purdue's going to have to get some luck here eventually. These games are going to get hard. I think maybe Lance Jones banking in that three before the half here tonight maybe was a positive sign that, you know, the, the karmic gods are going to, you know, start to even things out for Purdue here if you believe in gods of karma. Um, people would call it the basketball gods. Uh, I, I don't really know what I'm talking about right now. I'm making up deities. Um, so, all right, look, so I'm obviously loopy uh, and just out of things to say, but I'm saying things anyway. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, so from Gainbridge Fieldhouse, for the last time this weekend, from what I consider to be the greatest event in sports, um, even though there's a lot of things to have mixed feelings about in terms of the nature of college basketball and the sausage factory that it is, uh, this is Brian Newbert from GoldenBlack.com following Purdue's 106-67 to win over Utah State. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. And thank you for processing our materials, however as you process our materials. And thank you once again to the Premium Club Hotel. And thank you to all of you who are watching on YouTube who liked and subscribed. Uh, the, the kids like to say you need to smash the like button. I think that's a little bit too profane uh, for my delicate sensibilities. But if you could like and subscribe, um, please feel free. Also, check out goldenblack.com. We're going to have a ton of stuff from Detroit. We're going to have a ton of follow-up from this weekend. Uh, there's going to be lots of good Purdue basketball stuff up on our website uh, here this week. So if you have not joined our site, become a member of our ever-welcoming, -welp ever-heartfelt uh, community of, of Purdue degenerates. Uh, by all means, please consider doing so now. Uh, we would appreciate it. And um, I will uh, talk to you guys again next week from, I want to say Little Caesars Arena, but these damn facilities change names so often. I really shouldn't even say it because I'll find out it changed or something. I'm pretty sure it's the Little Caesars. But the sight of Isaac Haas breaking his elbow. We'll just call it that. All right, everybody. See you.